our keynote speaker, Madam Paula Gaviria Betancourt, Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs. Following the remarks from the Special Rapporteur, we are very excited to welcome a remarkable and distinguished group of panelists for discussion on the role of the guiding principles. We will then open the floor to interventions and questions before turning uh, to closing remarks from the Special Advisor to the UN Special uh, Secretary General on Solutions to Internal Displacement, Mr. Robert Piper. But before I pass the floor to Madam Gaviria, a few housekeeping uh, reminders for all of us. Uh, we will be recording today's discussion for those who cannot attend. Uh, we are in, currently in webinar function, so you'll note that your microphone should automatically be muted. Uh, but as we move to the discussion portion of the meeting, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand button or writing in the chat box. For interventions from the floor uh, during the latter part of this event, we will start with those who pre-register to speak uh, when they RSVP'd. Uh, we'll also then, time permitting, invite others to make interventions who wish to do so. Uh, we welcome and we're looking forward to a dynamic discussion today. So if any of you have questions uh, directed toward any of our speakers today, and I know I have many of them myself, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, please do use the time during the chat box uh, to insert your questions so that even during the panel discussion, we can address them as they come out. There is interpretation in French, Spanish, and Arabic for today's event, uh, and you'll have been prompted to select a language when you first join the event. But access to access the interpretation options or change languages, you can click on the three dots on the toolbar at the top of the screen, then select language and speech, then language interpretation to pick the desired language screen. Uh, we will put these instructions in the text box for all of you. So with that housekeeping aside, it's my privilege to formally introduce our keynote speaker for today's event, Madam Paula Gaviria Betancourt, who is joining us today from Honduras, where they are having a national commemorative event immediately following this event. Uh, Madam Paula Gaviria Betancourt was appointed Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons by the Human Rights Council and assumed this role as the first Latin American woman on 1st November 20, uh, of, of, of last year. She's a human rights lawyer and a forced displacement expert with over two decades of experience in human rights and in humanitarian affairs. She's also executive director of Fundacion Compaz, a nonprofit organization that works to build peace and reconciliation in her home country. She was also a member of the UN Secretary General's high level panel on internal displacement. Madam Gaviria, Paula, my friend, over to you. Thank you, Sam. It's an honor to convene this event to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. This is a celebration close to my heart and one that fits well with the theme freedom, equality and justice for everyone for the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. This event is organized with UNHCR and the Protection Cluster, a joint engagement that reflects this long-standing collaboration, as well as with the Protection Expert Group created by my predecessor and them, as a space for focused attention and exchange and dialogue on protection of IDPs like this event we're having today. Having this opportunity to hear from the first representative of the Secretary General and his then special advisor, as well as two of my predecessors on this panel is momentous, considering how deeply tied they are to the development and trajectory of influence the guiding principles have had. The special advisor on solutions presence here is representative of his time of this time of unprecedented mobilization within the UN system to support durable solutions for IDPs on a scale not seen before. I want to express my appreciation to our speakers dialing from South Sudan and Yemen and participating online from Honduras before their national commemorative event starts and many other governments, IDPs, host communities, UN, civil society, and NGOs and different stakeholders are working worldwide towards putting the guiding principles into practice in their countries. 
I am humbled to see so many online now and look forward to their interventions. As Special Rapporteur of the Human Rights of IDPs, I am mandated by the UN Human Rights Council to use the guiding principles in my dialogues with governments, states, civil society, the UN, and other international organizations, and to support their dissemination and promote their use, including in the development of imp and implementation of domestic laws and policies. The guiding principles on internal displacement are a collection of principles that define who is an internally displaced person in situations of armed conflict, generalized violence, disasters, and human rights violations, and restate international human rights and humanitarian law standards that are most relevant to internally displaced persons. Reframing international legal standards in a small booklet that today may appear trivial. In a few clicks on a computer or tap on your mobile phone, you can download them in PDF in more than 40 languages, watch on YouTube an explanatory video series by my predecessor, or take a free online course. But in fact, the guiding principles were groundbreaking in many ways and have been proven to be a timeless guide today. At a time when states were vis-a-vis -vis other states and the international community highly protective of their national sovereignty and the principle of non-interference in their internal affairs, the guiding principles brilliantly affirmed the flip side of the sovereignty coin. National authorities have the primary responsibility to address internal displacement. They have been used as an authoritative tool for dialogue and to guide on action on how to prevent, address, and resolve the phenomenon, how to protect internally displaced persons and people at risk of displacement in reference to the full spectrum of human rights without discrimination and as do other persons in the country. Regretfully, the UN guiding principles are just as relevant today as they were 25 years ago. The 2021 report of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Internal Displacement declared internal displacement a global crisis. At the end of 2021, there were 59.1 million internally displaced people across the world, and I understand the number still to be announced is higher for 2022. We are here because we can be inspired by the progress made thanks to the guiding principles and to consider how renewed commitment to their use can help meet the challenges of these times. Many of the foundations laid by the guiding principles are recognized and have been progressively expanded over the past 25 years. Sovereignty as responsibility, primary responsibility of the state to protect, are widely recognized as a common premise for engagement and whole of society uh, approach, whole of government approaches are now standards to aim for. IDP's participation envisaged in the guiding principles has broadened to encompass engaging IDPs as right holders with agency in all matters that affect them, including in law, policy, and durable solution processes, as well as in others such as peace building and transitional justice. The guiding principles are recognized in and have inspired to provis the provisions of the African Union Kampala Convention and the laws, the policies, the strategies, or action plans on internal displacement of 46 countries. Last month, Honduras became the 15th country to enact a law on the protection and assistance of IDPs. This is enormous progress in 25 years. Coming forth, there is predictable and more collaborative engagement by my mandate, UN, ICRC, and other organizations to support at country level, multi-stakeholder inclusive processes to develop and implement national responses on internal displacement. So how can you use the guiding principles to help translate such gains into more government and community action and impact on the lives of the IDPs? There is a strong call and commitment to course correct and to innovate how the UN system and interagency supports national ownership, responsibility, and accountability, in particular to unlock solutions for IDPs through stronger and early engagement by development actors. 
How can we strengthen the visibility and use of the guiding principles as the human rights thread that tie prevention, protection, and solutions together? With the report of the high-level panel on internal displacement and the follow-up Secretary General's action agenda reflecting a global state of play, we have a common foundation for concerted action and unprecedented mobilizing of the UN system. I believe our speakers and participants can help us match some lessons with the guiding principles from the past to the ambitions and commitments that have been set to break through on the three interlinked goals of prevention, protection, and durable solutions. Thank you all once again. I'm looking forward to listening to all the panelists. Back to you. Thank you, Madam Gaviria, for those keynote remarks. Indeed, we are hoping uh, to explore further the groundbreaking work, and we have some of the groundbreakers with us uh, around the guiding principles. But in particularly, I think all of our focus always has and will continue to be how to translate this, as you say, so wisely into government and community action, and in the end, how it impacts the lives of those affected by internal displacement. May we all hear more today about how we can innovate, how we can keep the human rights thread, and how we can continue to progress and build on these foundations. Um, we're now going to move to our panel discussion, and I'm very excited uh, to welcome our guests for this portion of the event. Um, following the dialogue among the panelists, we will then open for some uh, for, for comments and questions. But again, as I say, please feel free to use the chat box to, to pose questions now, and we can uh, hopefully address them uh, during the course of our panel. Um, as ever, uh, I'd like to ask our speakers to respond uh, not only to the questions, but also with any reflections you may have. Um, and, and feel free, uh, really, as our panelists, we're here to listen to you and to, to your interactions with one another. Uh, feel, feel free uh, to, to offer any thoughts you have, but also in concisely, and we'd be very happy to go back and forth with one another. Uh, to begin with, um, it's my honor, firstly, to uh, welcome Ambassador Francis Deng. Uh, the very first representative of the Secretary General on internal displacement, uh, under whom the guiding principles were developed and who submitted these global standards to the UN Commission on Human Rights 25 years ago today. Uh, he is joined alongside Roberta Cohen, who was Ambassador Deng's senior advisor uh, during this crucial moment in history. Uh, may I first turn to Ambassador Deng uh, and, and pose a question to you uh, which is that the gu guiding principles affirm the primary responsibility of national authorities to protect and assist their displaced citizens and residents. Can you talk a bit more about the concept you coined sovereignty as responsibility, how these came to shape the core elements of the guiding principles, and your thoughts on the matter today? Over to you, Ambassador Dane. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I must say that I was really very touched by the overview that we got from the special rapporteur. And I think her uh, statement really encompassed both in uh, depth and width uh, the approaches and the issues that we considered in dealing with this issue. I want to highlight the fact that collaboration, both in terms of individuals who were involved in the drafting of the guiding principles, and also in terms of reaching out for others to work together in promoting the guiding principles and uh, in working with governments. I have to say that the, the fact that we are commemorating 25 years later the guiding principles and what we have heard said by the special rapporteur really assures me that the guiding principles have succeeded and are now promising to succeed. I want to just highlight the fact that the concept of sovereignty as responsibility was intended to address the sensitivity of the issue of internal displacement. Because as we know by definition, it's internal and therefore touches on sovereignty. And what we intended to do was number one, to state the norm, the principle of responsibility of the state, but also implicit in sovereignty as responsibility is not only persuading the government to recognize that principle, but also working with the government and working with the governments also relates to international collaboration with the governments, which means that collaboration in a broad sense 
So we, as we later on developed other aspects of the approach, there are at least three pillars involved. The primary responsibility of the state, supporting the state, and when the state fails, there are other obligations that the international community can then turn to. So the guiding principles, in a sense, embody both the norms in terms of the uh, uh, what you might call the liability or, or, or responsibility of the state in legalistic terms. And when I say legalistic terms, the guiding principles embody core principles of human rights law, humanitarian law, and analogous refugee law, but at the same time are intended to be soft. That's why we call them guiding principles. Soft in the sense of not frightening the government to be defensive or opposed, but to be co uh, cooperative. So that's the second aspect of uh, the guiding principles. It's, it's to state the law, but also to emphasize the softness, the gentle cooperation, persuasion of the government to cooperate. But when all that fails, then we turn to other uh, aspects of the responsibility. Let me just say, because I understand that time is not on our side and we have to be very brief. What I find very compelling, even about the presentation we just heard, is not only that we look back to how the guiding principles develop and how they have since been disseminated and actually applied, but more importantly, into the future. And talking about the future, to me, it continues to be a question of building on the law, basing our uh, approach on the legalistic aspect of the guiding principle, but also the persuasive aspect. That means engaging the government to see the guiding principles, not as a threat to their sovereignty, but as a tool for cooperating with them to discharge the responsibilities which are in the first place theirs for their people. And the world is there to help them do what is actually their responsibility. I'll stop here and pass back to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Deng, for those. And we do hope to come back to you with some further reflections as well uh, in this panel discussion. But may I turn now to uh, Ms. Roberta Cohen. Um, you were alongside the ambassador. Uh, you were at the center of the efforts to ensure a collaborative uh, and inclusive process to develop the guiding principles. Uh, Roberta, can we ask you, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Once they were submitted to the Commission on Rights, there was the need not only for the collaborative inclusive process, but also the need to continue to disseminate and socialize these principles around the world, which is no easy task at all. Can you share how you went about that and any reflections you have also uh, on the collaborative inclusive process, on the need to disseminate and socialize these and any other reflections you may have? Uh, Roberta, over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, first, let me say how meaningful it is uh, to be part of a program commemorating the Guiding Principles 25th anniversary, having been involved in organizing the initial process uh, and uh, not knowing uh, how it was going to turn out. Uh, so thank you to the Special Rapporteur and to UNHCR, um, and of course to Francis for his great inspiration for all of those who were involved at the time. Now, you refer to the inclusiveness of the drafting process of the principles, but it's important to note that the inclusiveness was intended to enrich the document, but also to promote ownership of the principles by a wide variety of UN agencies and NGOs. After all, the legal team headed by Walter Kalin could have been limited to international experts from academic institutions, but it included UNHCR, OHCHR, and the ICRC. And as the draft progressed, we organized consultations with all the humanitarian and development agencies and the NGOs that were part of the UN Interagency Standing Committee. Uh, so by the time the principles were introduced into the commission, IASC members under the leadership of Sergio Vieira de Mello had already endorsed the principles and were advocating for them in the commission. Uh, OCHA even printed 
10,000 copies so that UN agencies and NGOs could run with them uh, as soon as the commission acknowledged them. And that was the dissemination strategy at headquarters, but how is it carried out in the field? Uh, it was the RSG, it was Francis Deng, who began to introduce the guiding principles to governments on his country missions. And we began to hold country seminars, sometimes at the same time as the mission, and with UN agencies to increase the impact of the RSG visit on government and civil society, to recommend the development of national policies and laws, and to make clear the responsibilities of the national authorities in all phases of displacement from prevention to solutions. And remember at the time, that was really not known what those responsibilities were. Our strategy also gave special attention to regional and sub-regional organizations because neighboring countries bear the brunt of displacement. And seminars with these bodies in Africa, the Americas and Europe, uh, we managed to get the principles acknowledged, which proved very useful with governments. We also organized regional country meetings. For example, in the South Caucasus, we got the governments and civil society in Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia to come together. Uh, while in Mexico City, we got IDP associations and NGOs uh, from different Central American countries to join the meeting. And I remember that the Mexican foreign minister who hosted the conference went to the Organization of American States thereafter and got that regional body to acknowledge the guiding principles. Um, finally, a word on our efforts to help reinforce civil society. It would be an understatement to say that governments need prodding. Uh, so we worked with national human rights commissions. Uh, these are quasi-governmental bodies to take up IDP situations. We worked with lawyers groups uh, that reviewed their national laws in terms of the principles and press their governments to improve these laws. We worked with local NGOs that helped translate the principles into local languages. And some, I remember, provided training to IDP associations so that they could use the principles to advocate for better conditions in camps. And we worked with academics who used the principles to monitor conditions, hold courses, publish studies and engage in activism. I always remember a group of professors in India who told me how they used the principles to draw attention to IDP camp conditions in the state of Assam. And then the state government in response announced that each IDP family would receive cash compensation. And in Colombia with a highly active civil society, the constitutional court cited the principles and ordered the government to provide more material aid to IDPs. So in sum, we found the principles to be more than a piece of paper, but a document that could come alive, be empowering and help produce results. Thank you very much, Roberta, for those remarks and indeed, uh, not just a document, but coming alive and empowering is, is, is certainly something that we'll keep in mind and it is a, a good way to look at the guiding principles and the progress we've made today. Uh, it's my pleasure to now turn to the next panelist, uh, which is uh, Chaloka Biani, uh, joining us from South Sudan. Uh, Dr. Chaloka Biani uh, was the first special rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs uh, after the mandate uh, shifted or ceased from being that of a representative of the Secretary General, uh, holding that mandate from 2010 to 2016. Uh, he is also a former expert advisor to the high level panel on internal displacement and currently also a member of the IDP protection expert group. Uh, Mr. Biani is joining us from Juba, South Sudan. Uh, where a local dialogue on the guiding principles just took place. So we look forward also to hearing from you on the progress from that. Uh, Mr. Biani is joined alongside uh, by Nyajima Gatkuas, uh, an internally displaced person in Juba, South Sudan, uh, who also participated in today's meeting in Juba. Uh, you've also working with nonviolent peace force. Very, very pleased to have you with us. Uh, may I start with you, Chaloka? Um, the guiding principles now underpin dozens of national IDP laws and policies around the world. 
could you speak to us a bit about your experience in the process of transforming the non-binding guiding principles into national laws and policies, as well as regional frameworks, such as the African Union's Kampala Convention? Uh, Mr. Biani, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, first of all, let me just say it's an honor and a great privilege to be able to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the guiding principles in the presence of uh, Francis Deng, Roberta uh, Cohen, and of course, uh, contemporary colleagues and friends. It marks, we may not uh, actually quite grasp it, but it's a quarter of a century, uh, 25 years ago, when the guiding principles uh, were formulated uh, and adopted. Um, it's quite an, observe, uh, an absorbing uh, experience, uh, mainly because there is the task of ensuring that the guiding principles are a living instrument through national laws and policies. Uh, and of course, the Kampala Convention uh, is the obvious regional instrument uh, incorporating them. Um, but I think the, the main experience is that, first of all, there has to be national ownership. Uh, you do not impose a policy or a law on a government. Uh, legislative function is the main function uh, of governments. Uh, policies are also the preserve uh, of governments. Um, and so at the invitation of governments uh, through legislative advocacy, uh, one identifies the legal framework uh, of a country uh, in which the policy or the, the law has to be situated. Um, and one is mindful of the fact that the guiding principles are substantive, they are open texture, set of them, uh, but these then have to be transformed into sources of law, sources of policy at national level. I think that's the first uh, challenge uh, to do. Uh, the second is to create structures that will enable the application and implementation of the guiding principles uh, at national level, uh, as well as at regional level. Uh, and now we speak of a whole of government approach in terms of coordination, uh, a whole of society approach uh, in terms of uh, durable solutions, which shows how the guiding principles have been transformed into living practice in relation to the protection uh, of IDPs as well as providing uh, solutions uh, for them. So typically, an event will start with a workshop on the guiding principles and the protection of IDPs. So it's an educational exercise to try and bring everyone involved in the exercise to speed. The workshop will have a range of stakeholders, um, from government ministers to members of the parliament, to civil society, to UN organizations, uh, IDPs themselves, and other entities. After the first rounds of the workshop, you then have to produce a zero draft uh, after the discussions, and it's clearly back zero draft, so it's not threatening uh, in any way but it puts your original ideas and your understanding of how the policy or the law has to incorporate the guiding principles. There's then a discussion uh, from amongst uh, the members of the workshop. Um, and of course, here you have to build trust and confidence. Uh, governments will not let you draft a policy or a law uh, unless they actually feel that you're able to do so. Uh, and that what you're doing is for the benefit of the government and the IDPs. Uh, you know, primarily. You then read really draft, of course, on the basis of uh, the comments uh, that have gone in, and then you have the first draft, um, which again is discussed, um, looking at various recommendations that were made in the workshops, how they are reflected um, in the draft itself. So the draft will have this, the sources, the structures, the general principles extrapolated from the guiding principles and then fundamentally the structure of the guiding principles in terms of um, protection from arbitrary uh, displacement. And you have to look at what other forms of arbitrary displacement exist in a particular country. Uh, in South Sudan, for example, cattle rustling was identified uh, as, as a cause of uh, arbitrary displacement. Uh, and this comes from the participants uh, you know, within the country. Then you have to look at uh, protection um, during displacement and how the principles in the guiding principles can be transformed to provide concrete protection within a country 
um, and then of course uh, humanitarian assistance and protection after displacement in the context of durable solutions and throughout all of these phases you have to earmark the primary responsibility uh, of the state as Francis has indicated but it runs from the basic primary responsibility to the provision of humanitarian assistance and onto durable solutions. So those aspects have a primary character in the guiding principles uh, as regards the way in which uh, governments have to discharge their responsibilities. Uh, thereafter, if they're happy, then you have a validation workshop, which formally validates the policy uh, or the law. And at that point, it's then handed over you know, to the government. So these processes have engaged from Afghanistan in terms of policies, but in terms of laws, it was South Sudan, actually. And today we are assured that the IDP bill uh, will be enacted into law uh, before the end of this year. Uh, in Somalia, it has been approved by the Council of Ministers. It's now waiting to go to, um, to Parliament. And in Ethiopia, I was in Ethiopia about three weeks ago, uh, they want to complete the transitional justice framework uh, in order to include it uh, in the draft bill, as, as well as the special rapporteur indicated, the guiding principles as, are also relevant to transitional justice. Thank you so much, Dr. Viani, for uh, your remarks here. I'm very pleased now to turn uh, to Madam Nyajima next to you. Um, and please uh, pose the next question to you. The, Madam Najima, the guiding principles call for the meaningful participation of displaced people in decisions about their futures. It's about IDPs being at the table together. Could you speak about this from your perspective, the importance of IDP inclusion and participation, and maybe its relevance to the transitional peace process in South Sudan? Madam Najima, over to you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and my greeting to all of you and people from the global. I'm very happy to be the part of the meeting today. As an IDP, I talk out of experience of my expectation from the guiding principle. I personally, or the rest of the IDP, they will be feeling with the power that they are recognized. We feel that we are recognized, we are not discriminated, and our rights will be respected. I can think also it gives us the opportunity to, to decide for ourselves where to go and where can we be next after the IDP can. Those are the principles they give us and also it reminds us to, come, to have some questions about social conditions uh, during the global home. How are we going to live with the most community back their home, their life, and because it has been a long time for us to be in the IDP can also around. And also it gives us the, the opportunity as the IDP to know the agencies that are involved in the provision of the guiding principle and the national authority. So we go directly or advocate our needs that we needed to be to be given to us. Also, the thing that makes it to be more important is for the IDP to be monitored to see whether this action is really effective or is not effective. Because it can be just said at the daily level, but later on the implementation, it cannot go as IDP they needed it. So it has process of a monitor, and when you see anything that does not go the way we feel good about it, we can also easily advocate and talk about it, and then people will see on how they can address those gaps for the IDP. So I think it's very important for us to be a part of it, because it's created because of us. Without IDP, there will be no guiding principle for the IDP. So it's my pleasure to be part of this discussion. And Colleagues, we may have lost sound uh, from Juba. Oh, Najima, yeah, we just lost you for a few seconds. Would you like to conclude? Okay. So I was saying, for this, for this guiding principle is connected to the durable solutions on IDP participation in this process in South Sudan, 
It can make happy, give us the power and monitoring closely on the peace process and the implementation. And about the returnees of IDPs back home, it gives us the power and the knowledge to know where are we going and what are we going to do next and what are the services also that are available there. Because this guiding principle is meant for us and we have to be well aware of it and we have to be sure that things that are going like the way they are written and is there implementation or there is no implementation. So we feel we are part of the process and we will continue being the part of the process and we appreciate the the holders of this guiding principle and the support from the whole international community participated to make sure that IDP rights are being recognized and being respected. So we are very happy and I personally am very happy for us to be included in the table 25th anniversary for guiding principle. Thank you, Nyajima, for that. And we certainly uh value your your role as I see two champions on the ground there uh, in South Sudan and a great partnership uh, both between Dr. Chaloka Bayani and yourself uh, indeed giving us much hope for transformation and change uh, for the people uh, of South Sudan. Thank you uh, for sharing with us. Um, I'd like to move now to another person who has experienced internal displacement himself uh, and we have a panelist Ahmed Al Zabidi. Uh, a representative of the Shabwa Youth Organization in Yemen. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if I could uh, address you uh, as a member of the advisory board to the UNHCR task team on engagement and partnerships with organizations led by displaced and stateless persons. While we know you're not speaking on behalf of the advisory board, you have this experience. Can you talk to us about the importance of including displaced people themselves in global discussions of policies on in addressing internal displacement? Uh, Mr. Ahmed Al Zabidi, over to you. And please, if you don't uh, uh, forget to please go ahead and unmute yourself, um, and then we would welcome your remarks. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, Masmo, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, marhaban bil jamia wa shukran jazeelan ala itahat hadi al hursa. Ana astatay tahadat bil arabi halis kadalik. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Shukran jazeen ala taahat hadhi al-fursah wa taba'an al-nazuh wa min as'ab marahal al-umr al-lati yamur bha al-insan wa tisabab fi kathir min al-mu'anah wa al-iqtarabat al-nafsiya. Lidhalik ashraak al-nazihin fi munagishat al-siyasat al-alamiyah amr muhim jiddan wa amr muhim lil-ghaya. وشكرا للمفوضية السامية على إتاحة هذه الفرصة وترتيبات النقاشات إشراك النازحين يضمن أولا تجنب انتهاك حقوقهم ويضمن إيجاد حلول مستدامة لمشاكلهم كذلك يعمل على سد الفجوات المستمرة في الحصول على البيانات خصوصا فيما يتعلق بالنساء والأطفال النازحون كونهم غير مرئيين في البيانات العالمية والوطنية مقارنة بأولئك الذين يعبرون الحدود حيث نجد أن الدول بشكل كبير تركز على المهاجرين الذين يعبرون الحدود من دولة إلى أخرى بينما النازحون داخليا لا يعرف مصيرهم واحتياجاتهم وهذا أمر نعمل أن أن يكون في المستقبل وهذه بشارات خير أنه سيكون هناك تغيير في هذا الجانب بالإضافة إلى ذلك فإن أهمية إشراك النازحين في مناقشة السياسات العالمية سيعمل على تقييم مخاطر الحماية بشكل آمن وموثوق وكذلك بشكل صحيح والحصول ويمكن الجهات والمانحة والدول من الحصول على بيانات قوية وصحيحة من قبل النازحين أنفسهم من خلال مشاركاتهم خصوصا في القضايا الحساسة للحماية 
والتي عادة لا يتم الإبلاغ عنها مثل الاعتداءات الجنسية والاستغلال والعنف المنزلي وبالتالي عند الحصول على بيانات صحيحة وقوية من خلال مشاركة النازحين أنفسهم في مناقشة السياسات العالمية سيتم تحديد طرق التدخل والحماية وكذلك الاحتياجات المطلوبة لهم سواء الفورية أو طويلة المدى المتعلقة سواء بالحماية أو التغذية أو التعليم أو الصرف الصحي والصحة وغيرها من من الاحتياجات. شكرا لا أطيل عليكم أنتهي إلى هنا. شكرا جزيلا. Thank you so much, uh, سيدة أحمد الزبيدي. Uh, Thank you very much for those remarks. Um, May I move on now to uh, welcome Madam Cecilia Jimenez Damri uh, to join us uh, on the panel here. Uh, Madam Cecilia, uh, she succeeded uh, Chaloka Bayani as special rapporteur uh, on the human rights of IDPs and just completed her tenure as mandate holder in October of last year. Uh, we hope she's also enjoying some well-deserved rest. Uh, she also is a member of the IDP <laughs> Protection Expert Group. Uh, Madam Cecilia, uh, if I could turn to you and, and prompt you for some of your reflections on this, uh, this commemorative day. Uh, you yourself took the initiative to continue disseminating and sharing the guiding principles during the term of your mandate, uh, but especially to local communities. And you even, I was pleased to join you uh, as you recorded and launched a video series on the guiding principles on YouTube. Uh, we'll share the link to this in the chat. But may I ask you uh, to please uh, share with us your thoughts about the importance of bringing the guiding principles to local communities and not just national and international actors. Any, and any other reflections you may wish to share with us? Madam Cecilia, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Sam Chung, and it's really a pleasure for me to join you. Thank you for the invitation, and I have listened with great interest to the speakers preceding me, spe beginning with the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs. Since the endorsement of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement in 1998, which endorsement we are commemorating today, it is very, it is very clear that the key to the protection, human rights protection of internally displaced persons and the promotion of those human rights lay in their implementation, implementation, implementation. And as we all know, the principal responsibility for this rests with state authorities and the former um, special advisor to the Secretary General, Ambassador Francis Deng, has really been able to, uh, to uh, pursue that this, the sovereignty means responsibility. The principal responsibility for implementation of the guiding principles is actually supported by a vast range of stakeholders from the international community, but I think also as important, if not more important, national and local actors. Neither can the implementation of the guiding principles be undertaken without the political agency of the internally displaced persons themselves, whose participation in decisions affecting them is an, was an important running theme during my mandate, as well as the participation, the social cohesion that is needed for at local and host communities. And why is that? Because the guiding principles can only be really relevant if people themselves see that they are of use to them and that it will be protecting their rights from beginning to the end. Dissemination for the purpose of the if such implementation was therefore one of my key priorities. The 2018 to 2020 plan of action, which commemorated the 20, uh, 20th anniversary of the guiding principles, which I launched with Austria, Honduras, and Uganda with the support of the UNHCR and OCHA. This was an important multi-stakeholder platform that dynamized dissemination and discourse on how the guiding principles can be mainstreamed into laws, policies, and as importantly, always into actual practices. 
the GP20 plan of action brought in focus the need for the guiding principles at national level implementation where they matter most, directly involving many UN uh, states to ensure that the guiding principles are translated into appropriate laws, be it national or local laws, and as well as policies and programs that integrate prevention, protection, and solutions. In order to do this, many stakeholders are actually involved in such dissemination and implementation of the guiding principles. They are the bearers of the guiding principles to where they actually matter on the ground. I also would like to emphasize that the social element for the dissemination of the guiding principles is also essential. And we need to confirm again and again that the principles is not merely a legal document, as has already been emphasized. And as a legal document, they contain norms, yes, many of which are now used slogans and hard law, but it's only effective if it remains a living instrument that is used at the local level by the internally displaced persons, by local bodies, the communities, also if the guiding principles are being taught, researched on by academic institutions, only if the guiding principles are advocated for by local and national human rights NGOs and humanitarian NGOs, but also I'd like to emphasize again, advocated for by all of us, wherever we are. Dissemination is therefore done not only by a select few, it's not something that's an elite document, but it has to be by a multitude of, the, of actors. The guiding principles is applicable in a variety of circumstances, not only in situations of armed conflict and violence, natural disasters, including those linked to climate change, but also to the ever-growing number of situations linked to development projects that displace thousands of people around the world. One last word, the international community needs to continue to push that April 17 is commemorated as an international day for internally displaced persons. A day like this held annually and officially would help keep the steadfastness that is needed, not only for dissemination, but for actual implementation on the ground. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Madam Cecilia. Indeed, uh, to ensure the steadfast commitment to progress, we've seen we're hearing so much about the efforts in the last 25, and indeed, uh, those efforts are needed uh, in, in the coming period as well. Uh, now, may we travel back to Honduras, um, where uh, Madam Gaveria is joined alongside uh, the government of Honduras um, uh, in the room. Uh, as, as well as uh, other colleagues. Uh, may I turn it to you in terms of some reflections? In December, the National Congress of Honduras passed a landmark law for the prevention, assistance, and protection of displaced persons. It was signed by the president in January uh, this week, right around the anniversary of the guiding principles. Uh, mark, this marks the entry into force of this IDP protection law. Madam Gaviria, we're going to bring in uh, with you uh, the voice of the government officials uh, with you today, uh, who I understand are, are around you, although I cannot uh, see on camera clearly yet, but I hope it will pan over to them. So if I will, uh, first to Madam Secretary for Human Rights, uh, Ms. Natalia Rogue, uh, very good to see you again, uh, welcoming you uh, to this commemorative event. Congratulations to you on the new law. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, can you please tell us how the law aims to uphold the rights of displaced people as affirmed by the guiding principles? Madam Secretary, over to you. Muchas gracias y buenos días. Un gusto encontrarles a todos y a todas en este espacio. Mi abrazo desde Honduras y transmitimos también el saludo de nuestra presidenta Xiomara Castro y del gobierno solidario para nosotras. Es un orgullo, una enorme satisfacción haberles tenido hace cerca de tres meses 
y comprometernos junto con nuestro Congreso Nacional a aprobar esta ley y ahora ya poder estar aquí con ustedes con una ley aprobada y publicada, una ley que hay que decir que parte del esfuerzo de las organizaciones, sobre todo también con la participación de las comunidades, es un esfuerzo de más de ocho años que se tradujo finalmente con toda la voluntad política y el acompañamiento de nuestro Congreso Nacional en una ley. Esta ley para la prevención, atención y protección a personas desplazadas internamente fue aprobada recientemente, este diciembre de 2022, antes de cumplir un año de nuestro gobierno, el gobierno solidario, y es un hito histórico, pues constituye el primer marco legal en Honduras enfocado en proteger a las personas y comunidades de un impacto del impacto del desplazamiento forzado a causa de la violencia, de la violencia generalizada que tiene en este momento un impacto significativo en la sociedad hondureña. El contenido de esta ley hace suyo los 30 principios rectores y dotan a la ley de una visión basada en derechos diferenciada y respetuosa de la dignidad humana. Es un importante instrumento estos principios rectores y hoy en este vigésimo quinto aniversario decirles que fue una brújula. Los principios rectores han sido guías para el proceso de diseño de nuestra ley que contribuyeron a, a plasmar con claridad los derechos de las poblaciones desplazadas y la obligación primaria que tenemos como Estado para su protección. La aplicación trasciende el proceso de construcción de nuestra ley y está siendo incorporada también en la puesta en marcha de los mecanismos de protección como el que ya desarrollamos desde la Secretaría de Derechos Humanos en conjunto y con el apoyo de las organizaciones de Naciones Unidas, especialmente del Alto Comisionado para los Refugiados. Nuestro país ha avanzado con paso sostenido para ir construyendo progresivamente estas medidas de respuesta, tomando en cuenta también lo dramática de la situación del desplazamiento. Y aún antes de contar con esta ley, un ejemplo es la Dirección para la Protección de Personas Desplazadas Internamente que tenemos en la Secretaría de Derechos Humanos. Honduras también ha sido un país en la región que ha marcado también liderazgos en la respuesta que se dan a este fenómeno, entre ellas la protección mediante el marco integral de regional de protección y soluciones. Y en este 2022, Honduras asumió su, presidente, su presidencia pro tempore y lideramos el grupo de trabajo de desplazamiento interno, lo que nos ha permitido compartir esta experiencia y aprender también de las buenas prácticas de otros países. Si bien contamos con importantes logros, esta implementación de la ley implica un reto importante, implica construir todo un entramado, un andamiaje institucional que garantice respuestas integrales y sobre todo también algo muy importante que lo hemos señalado en diversas ocasiones, implica un nue una nueva caracterización de la situación de desplazamiento en nuestro país, tener claro cómo el fenómeno en este momento está afectando a un porcentaje significativo de la población como primer paso para la aplicación de la ley. Agradecemos la participación y la presencia en este momento de la relatora especial Paula Gaviria por acompañarnos en este diálogo también que será más adelante un diálogo nacional que constituirá una oportunidad única para que implementemos, para aprender y para compartir experiencias y para compartir, por supuesto, los retos significativos que tenemos en cuanto a la implementación de la ley. Sabemos que no estamos solas, que es precisamente el acompañamiento de las organizaciones internacionales y del sistema de Naciones Unidas lo que ha permitido que tengamos esta ley, que era una demanda de las organizaciones de sociedad civil y que desde el primer momento recibimos en nuestros despachos a las diversas organizaciones en territorio y que ahora pues nos congratulamos de poder tener una ley, pero también es el momento de acuerparnos y de acompañarnos en el proceso de implementación. Agradezco nuevamente el espacio y devuelvo la palabra a ustedes. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, for those remarks and indeed uh, such a positive example 
uh, uh, of leadership being set in the in the country of Honduras. Uh, it really uh, harkens uh, Francis Deng's discussions on, and mentioning of, of collaboration and sovereignty and of, as responsibility being put into practice there. Uh, as I turn to Madam Gaviria, uh, Paula, to, to you for some additional remarks on Honduras, uh, really, again, uh, we commend you, uh, particularly this collaboration between the UN and the international community. I know you're joined also by the UN resident coordinator, Alice Shackleford, there with you. Uh, really, this partnership and collaboration between the international and the national, we commend you uh, on this. Uh, but if I could turn to you regarding the guiding principles, um, which are established as a normative framework uh, with increasing numbers of states establishing laws and policies based on that framework, such as in Honduras, um, as special rapporteur, as the international community collaborating together uh, with the national uh, governments, what do we see as most important uh, when it comes to engaging and supporting states in implementing these laws and policies? Over to you in Honduras. Sam, thank you. So much, so much experience, so much inspiration from the previous speakers. Um, I think it's there. It's there since um, Francis Deng talked about the importance of persuasion um, and the importance uh, of, of participation, multi-stakeholder approach since uh, Roberta Cohen started uh, working on this and, and Chaloca's engagement working um, day to day in all the process involving the IDPs. Uh, I think the Honduran government and uh, and the communities and the displaced persons uh, here should be very proud of this important step for the country. Uh, and, and not only because of it's a law born out of dialogue that um, builds upon all this experience that other countries have had, but also about consensus among diverse sectors. Uh, and, and also because it's evidence of Honduras leadership in protecting those who are forced to flee. Uh, it is also a valuable exercise of, of sovereignty uh, in which the Honduran state has made its primary obligation and responsibility to respond to forced displacement uh, its own, its own. You are the reflection of the practicality of that uh, principle. And, and by adopting this law assumes this uh, commitment and this responsibility before the Honduran state, uh, the Honduran people, and the IDPs themselves, which is of high importance. So um, I think it's, it's true what Ahmed and ja Najima said. Um, these guiding principles were created for you at the end. Your voices are the most important and will continue to be the most important, as Cecilia was saying, in the implementation, implementation. And I told the ministry here, you're not alone. You're not alone. This is a huge challenge. You build the steps already. There's so many things you have done and so many steps you have taken already, even before the law, that the implementation is not going to be as hard. But also knowing that you're not alone is very important. And the IDP says are there to remind you that this is about them and they have to be also part of the implementation process, as I know that you're aware and you're working on it here in Honduras. That, that's all from me, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, and indeed, uh, we are not alone on this, and we can see that by the many who are joining us, by also by this, this, uh, this, this legacy of, of colleagues, uh, leaders, champions, uh, not only on this call, but across the world that have been working on this important issue. Uh, over the years. I'd, I'd like to continue and try to um, invite even additional reflections and thoughts from our from our eminent panelists since we have this special opportunity uh, with you today. And I we will begin uh, back with with Ambassador Dang and and uh, and Roberta Cohen. Uh, so just to we'll start with that and then we'll move on uh, more or less in the order 
uh, that we handled the panel to begin with. Uh, but we also have a couple of, of, of comments happening in the chat, and, and I and also in, like to invite our panelists to reflect on these and, and, and respond uh, as you may like. There are questions in terms of whether the guiding principles are one size fits all. That was written in the chat. Is it the same in, in, in all circumstances? We've heard, of course, the different um, situations of conflict, violence, of disaster, uh, but also different progress and different, um, you know, uh, levels of, of progress in, in countries. So are the guiding principles one size fits all? That's one of the questions in the chat that panelists may wish uh, to pick up on. There's also quite a lot of uh, discussion, particularly we've seen here on the situation of Ethiopia being raised in the chat. We have to flag that and recognize that, but I also want to have that reflect on the situation in, in many countries around the world, but some of them are very, very, uh, very in difficult situations of conflict and violence. There are, are comments in the chat about what about the guiding principles not working? in our country right now? What about immediate needs around whether it be food security, whether it be human rights violations and the like? Any reflection on this? Where, how do we speak to situations where it's felt that the guiding principles are not working for us today, but the urgency is now? So questions about that. We know in Ethiopia, we also know in other countries around the world where this question is posed. Third, there's also questions here on peace and security, and maybe it's somewhere along those same lines, really the interrelationship between peace and security, the guiding principles and putting them into concrete action. Once again, noting that these guiding principles were drafted for the people themselves. So with those, a little bit of the questions that are that are in the chat, maybe for, I can uh, prompt Ambassador Deng uh, to begin with, um, to share a little bit more. Uh, again, you touched on this issue of sovereignty and responsibility, your thoughts on it today, uh, on how we move forward, uh, on both building on the law, but the persuasive aspects, The uh, any, any reflections you may have uh, from governments in terms of expounding on the successes and cooperation, persuasion, all of this together. Uh, Ambassador Dang, over to you for some reflections, and then we'll turn to Roberta after that. Thank you very much, Sam. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We hear, we hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Well, first, I regret that I was not able to shift to translation to be able to get what the minister was saying, but I think I got the, the core of the gist of what she was saying. Uh, this is a very rich uh, conversation and, of course, input from people with different perspectives that add up. And I just want to highlight uh, a few points. One is that we were always conscious of linking protection with assistance so that governments would see that you are not only coming in with pointing fingers at failures and criticism, but also offering assistance to their needy. So that idea of linking protection and assistance was important. The other thing that was important was the element of prevention. Some of our legal experts were having some difficulty with the notion of prevention when it comes to the rights of the internally displaced, because they thought that legally it is easier to deal with uh, the rights of those who have already been displaced rather than dealing with protection, I mean, prevention. But we link that to the experience of refugees. And Madam Ogata had introduced the idea of prevention as a very important aspect, and we built on that. And finally, also the question of solutions. That was also a very important aspect. So you see the guiding principles dealing with prevention, protection during displacement, assistance, and solutions. The other thing I want to emphasize is the very delicate balance between the obligations, the legally binding concepts, and the aspect of persuasion or the soft law. And I say this to say, uh, as I often did when I visited countries, the first five minutes with governments were very important in saying, I come knowing that this is an internal issue, falls under your sovereignty, I'm respectful of sovereignty, but I don't see it negatively as a barricade against the world. I see it as a positive concept of state responsibility with the international support. And we are here to offer support of the international community. But it's also very important, and this is the delicate balance we want to, to take, it's important that when a state fails and people are suffering and dying, the world is not going to watch and do nothing. So there's a delicate way of letting them also know that they have an obligation that is binding and that failure has consequences. 
So I would say it's not so much what you say as it is how you say it. The combination is critically important. And, and I have had very practical experiences with governments fearful of my coming as someone with the legal norms to impose and someone with the orientation to persuade them. So that's, that's an important balance between the persuasion of legally binding instruments. That is to say, if, the, if you don't fulfill your obligations, ultimately there are consequences, but emphasize the responsibility first. Finally, is the aspect of regional cooperation that Robert alluded to. I do remember a situation in Sudan when the country was one of those very resistant to the guiding principles and to uh, the involvement of the international community with internal displacement. But I had a Minister of Foreign Affairs who was very cooperative with me. And he said to me in the end, you know, if we single out Sudan, and deal with the problems of Sudan in isolation, people will be defensive because our people are paranoid, he said. Let us make it regional so that countries see it as something we are in it for. I mean, we are in it together. And then we cooperate together in dealing, analyzing the problem, identifying what needs to be done, how to get it done, beginning with the responsibility of the state and the cooperation of the region. So I think the regional dimension is also critically important. Ultimately, we go back to the inclusivity of the responsibility and uh, any action, because when we started, we were conscious of the fact that there were organizations that were sensitive about any new norms being introduced. They thought it would dilute what already existed. So we began with involving them, and the guiding principles incrementally became inclusive in terms of the expertise that we mobilized, in terms of the organizations that were involved, and it became collectively owned. And I think that's a very important aspect, that we all feel that we own the guiding principles, the government, the affected people, the international community. And that is what I find quite exciting, is that it's not simply a question of having guiding principles that are binding, but also a tool for collaboration in the interest of all concerned and all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Deng. Uh, indeed, uh, as I turn uh, to your colleague, uh, Roberta, uh, if I can invite you on screen, uh, if, we, if you'd like to pick up on this thread of inclusivity of this responsibility of how we arrive at this collective ownership. I know in your remarks, uh, you mentioned even specific situations of IDP camps and this, uh, and applying uh, the, the advocacy around these issues of empowering and enabling those that were stakeholders in it, but also even these practical issues around translation uh, or, uh, of, of the guiding principles. But maybe over to you for any thoughts or reflections you have uh, on uh, inclusivity of this responsibility or even any of the, qu the questions that we have raised uh, during uh, the course of today. Uh, Roberta, over to you. Thank you. Um, let me mention that uh, the discussions made me think a bit about some of the lessons that came out of the dissemination strategy or the inclusiveness, as you, you would call it. Um, first of all, I recall that we had a number of seminars intended to influence governments. Uh, and one thing we discovered that it was important to include not just national but local authorities, uh, because they were often the ones with direct contact with the IDPs. And sometimes it was their local regulations. I remember about children in school documents that had to be adjusted so as not to impede assistance to IDPs. Um, Second, the point has been made that the principles make crystal clear that IDP participation is essential. And I was so pleased to hear from Ms. Najima from South Sudan and Mr. Al Zabidi from Yemen, um, as well as the former rapporteur Cecilia Jimenez and the current one, Polia Gaviria, on the importance of including IDPs in. Uh, protection efforts, peace processes, solutions. Uh, this relationship of peace and security is really very much um, should be emphasized because if IDPs are 
a destabilizing influence and don't have the attention that they require, uh, then peace and security is less assured in the country. And that argument, uh, in addition to the great need to to meet humanitarian um, and, and very desperate humanitarian needs, this is something that may be emphasized more. Um, third, we found that governments we're often interested in knowing about best practices in other countries. Uh, and I assume by now there have been evaluations of what worked in different countries and what is standing in the way of implementation of the principles and how to resolve that. And I know one of the questioners has asked about um, really the difficult cases and where the principles are not working well. Uh, I would hope that there would be, even if they're internal, evaluations of why this is not working in some countries and what steps and strategies ought to be pursued. Um, I would also say that uh, it's important to take a look at the laws and policies that have been identified. And here I believe the UN has, has compiled them. Um, we found that Laws and policies that simply reference the guiding principles would not be sufficient. Uh, they needed to be specific and cover all phases of displacement. Uh, and there's been talk here from prevention to solutions, as well as most causes of displacement, conflicts, disasters, and climate change. And also in future, I would imagine development projects. Um, these are not put in the description of the guiding principles, but they are in the guiding principles. Um, and uh, they were raised by, by um, former Rapporteur Jimenez. Uh, and I think that that is important to look at uh, how the persons uprooted by development projects fit into uh, application of these principles. I know there are other standards that um, relate to such uh, uh, persons. Uh, and in addition in laws, implementation measures need to be included. How are they going to be carried out in the country and are resources available? Um, and then finally, um, I would say that it's important to have an office at the UN to monitor on a regular basis the usage of the guiding principles. And I, and I hope that the UN's human rights advisors on IDPs will continue to provide technical assistance and training and encourage not only the development of laws and policies, but their implementation. Uh, I know this will take resources, but I would hope there is a, an office, as I say, something that really is, is dedicated to promoting uh, the implementation and usage of the principles. Um, and I really want to thank UNHCR for its involvement and support over the years for the principles. There are many players to thank, but UNHCR and the Brookings Project and the RSG did many projects together over the years, and they, they were really quite wonderful. And on collaboration, it's, it's um, evident, but maybe needed to be said again, the principles, when the principles are supported and promoted, by the full range of UN offices and agencies and countries. I mean, that is human rights, humanitarian, political development. You have a stronger foundation, more likely to sway governments, even reticent or resistant ones, uh, and influence their practices toward IDP. So today's program is a very good reflection of the coming together of some of these parts of the UN uh, and committing ourselves to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta, for those <laughs> remarks. Uh, indeed, so so timeless for us today and also very concrete also for areas for us to continue focusing on, including, as you mentioned, monitoring usage of the guiding principles and, and the best practices of which I know many of the stakeholders uh, continue to be involved in today. Uh, I'd like to turn for us back to Juba, South Sudan, um, and ask um, Dr. Chaloko Bayani and and J Madam Nyajima uh, to join us on camera once again. Uh, if I could turn it to you to uh, to offer us some reflections. Um, you've just completed a commemorative event. Uh, you've just undergone a workshop together. We've seen two champions on the ground. 
Chaloka, you of course have done regional and country workshops on and helped to the domestication of laws and policies in so many situations around the world. Uh, over to you for some reflections on where we stand today, uh, on how the progress of South Sudan is, uh, on on lessons and advice for others around the world. Uh, over to you, uh, let's uh, Dr. Chaloka Biani uh, and Madam Nyajima. Um, thank you very much, Sam. Um, let me probably express a, a few thoughts uh, on the Kampala Convention because I quite did it. I, I was mind was taking a bit more time. Um, but that was a different process altogether with about some 53 states uh, with about 10 delegations each negotiating an instrument. And the nervousness around the process was such that the states wanted to take control uh, and sort of take me out um, as the expert of the commission. And the African Union then turned to me and said, now you're the African Commission. You're acting on behalf of the African Commission. And with that endowment, um, you know, the strategy changed. But the relevance of, of the uh, Kampala Convention in the context of uh, the guiding principles is it takes the principle of primary responsibility throughout. So it's a state responsibility instrument. So instead of rights of IDPs, it's the obligations of states as a matter of state responsibility. Uh, Roberta Cole had mentioned the question of a development in use displacement, uh, which is referred to in the guiding principles uh, in the context of arbitrary uh, displacement that is not uh, overwhelmingly justified in the public interest. But the Kampala Convention has full provisions uh, on development-induced uh, displacement. Uh, something is always said about the guiding principles, disasters and climate change, which we uh, discussed today, and I'll come back to that. Um, but the Kampala Convention integrated that disasters and climate change uh, into one score because it realized that as a living instrument, um, slow onset, sudden onset disasters are related to climate change rather than disaggregate them uh, from climate change. But in the context of today's discussions here, I think they're very uh, enlightening. So much has happened since the IPEG mission uh, we had uh, the last time round. There was a great appreciation uh, of the guiding principles, understanding the sense of displacement, the phenomenon of displacement. Many people do not appreciate the coercive elements um, that is compelled, forced to leave or obliged to leave. Uh, and the question, which I think was also in the chat, was raised, how do you distinguish an, ID an IDP from someone who just moves uh, from one place to another? Um, and the answer, of course, is you have to look at the uh, coercive elements behind the movement. Uh, slow onset disasters and climate change, you have to look to adaptation. And the guiding principles clearly are linked as a living instrument uh, through disasters to those particular uh, aspects as well. But I think what has happened so much um, in reflection, we had noticed the lack perhaps of political will, uh, the waning presence um, of the government. That is changing and has changed. The political way with the president um, clearly issued a statement that he didn't want the country to go back in conflict uh, and wanted to sort out the problems. Uh, and with that, uh, the structures, I think, have been cramped uh, in action uh, towards, uh, you know, solutions. The durable solution strategy will be adopted as uh, soon, shortly. The, the view on IDPs as well, uh, given concrete assurance before, before the end of the year. And at the same time, the UN agencies, as, as we reflected, we had a, there was a panel discussion uh, looking at solutions, integrated approaches, essentially working on the nexus, um, humanitarian peace, humanitarian development, and of course, uh, adding climate change as well uh, to the nexus and reflecting in the context of the guiding principles and also the approaches uh, to engagement with the primary responsibility of the states, uh, preferably from bottom up, local authorities, state authorities, count authorities, uh, right up to the national government and trying to delineate their roles 
in that particular uh, sense. Uh, and I think what came out of those discussions is that there's a more cohesive, integrated approach uh, amongst uh, the UN agencies. We had the uh, representative of UNHCR, we had the representative of the Danish Refugee Council Civil Society, uh, we had the um, advisor in the office of the resident coordinator uh, on the triple nexus, and we also had the chief of section in UNMIS, the UN mission uh, on integration um, and, and issues of, um, of transition. I think a particular issue that, that arose was one of the closure or the movement of IDPs from POC sites uh, to camps. Uh, and underscoring the point that the IDP protection system discourages encampment for reasons that were, were expressed. But as we noted uh, last year, the problem of managing the transition and planning for the transition and ensuring that protection runs throughout that transition from POC sites uh, to camps and the handover of responsibilities of protection um, and, and, and the essential role of the government um, and I think that Najima will speak to most of those issues because I think those were her points uh, of contribution and reflection. So, in addition to what my colleagues say, as it could be, we have like, some action point. I can say the action point because I have some question to the local authority in the Midizara scene here in South Sudan. I listed some of the questions concerning the returnees of the IDPs, local, and then we also say they are doing assessment, whereby they have the coordination with the local authority back in the state platform, because I'm here in Liba. They say the assessment they do it, and whenever you are willing to go, you talk to me this year, and then they facilitate the process. And then I have also more of the services from the Mediterraneans to the IDP. Because there was a lot of gap that IDP who are residing in the IDP camp currently, they are not having the access for most of the services due the transit from the time of the transition of the POC from the POC to IDP camps. So there's a lot of gaps. The local authority was the one given the camp management, they are the one now managing. Before some of the NGOs are the one managing the camp where they provide some of the basic needs for the IDP, but since it was given over to the government, we are not satisfied because the government is not providing anything for the IDP. And then I ask them, if this kind of transition in the POC to IDP come and the expectation of IDP to return back home, is it something that will stop the service as a stop as contribution to the stop of the services to the IDP? And then they said no. Some people they are applying is that of the fund from the donors, and some they say we are giving the responsibility to the national, and then the national, the local national, the, the national, they say we don't have the resources, we are mobilizing the resources from the humanitarian, that's the gap, that's where the gap comes from, because really it's challenging it. People that are waiting for, for you to be integrated back home, and for the integration to be done in the process, it takes a long time. And if the services they stop, they are not providing, how do we, we expect that IDP will continue or sustain until they are integrated back to the home or to the states? And also, we have the knowledge that we saw Sudan here, there's a lot of places nearby, there's a flooding, and still there are some places where there's insecurity. So, in this kind of integration, which means not, not everyone will go at once. It's going to be a process that people they go slowly, slowly, and some people they have condition that they will not go, go back home, and some people maybe they they think of going to a different place, not to the same place where they come from. Also, we talk of the land and properties that they lost. The government, the local government here in South Sudan, promised that they are going to work on it to make sure that they return back the things to the IDP because it is their right for them to have those properties, and also the returning would not be something to be done. Just like it, for someone to say, okay, let me go back because it has been like a period of 10 years now, we have, uh, we have nothing back home. For us to start from zero, we need also the international community and the government co co to cooperate and then to see on how they do the assessment back home to make sure that there are services for the civilians, especially the social services like the water, 
the school, hospital, those things, they are not existing back home. There's no way for people to, to say that we are going there. But here also, we are feeling the threat that seeing the services that I stopped in the IDP camp, we are feeling like we are pushed to, to go back home to make sure that maybe there's some interest somewhere there, which is happy for IDP to go back so that people will say, oh, there's need, there's need. Because if it's a process, you have our right has to be respected. That is mentioned in the very principle that IDP provision of the services and the protection and the dignity should be respected and should be remained in place. Jamila, thank you, thank you so much uh, for that uh, closing remark. Uh, we're going to have to go on to the other speakers, but thank you. Your voice is heard so loud and clear, uh, and and your participation at the table with Chaloka at your side is also deeply appreciated. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to have to. Be, I know that we're running a little bit on time, so I'm going to unfortunately have to call upon the next panelist to be very, very uh, precise uh, and concise in your interventions. But I would like to hear from uh, each uh, of the others before we close. Uh, Madam Cecilia Jimenez Damri, if I could ask you to join me on screen. Uh, and if I could ask you just very, very concisely, if you had to call on, um, you've spoken so much about the role and of steadfastness needed uh, and the participation of local communities. Could I ask you just for some final thoughts uh, for us for the global audience uh, regarding how do we contain how do we continue and support the steadfastness needed for civil society for local communities to be active critical participants uh, in this and not just passive participants really at the center uh, of all of, of our, all of our efforts madam cecilia over to you very quickly thank you very much for giving me the floor sam yes civil society is of course very um, are very crucial actors particularly on the local, at the local level. They are usually the first responders and sometimes with or without the local government units and the international community. But we have seen that local NGOs, be it humanitarian or human rights, really have a big role to play to insist on two things. One is with regard to the link between humanitarian, humanitarian assistance provision and human rights. Uh, that being said, that humanitarian assistance cannot be provided without the human rights perspective in order that it can be effective. I think that's the first point that I would like to insist on. But the second point is equally important. Um, in addition to the actual contact and um, relationship of civil society with internally displaced persons themselves. There is also the, the, the importance of ensuring advocacy for the accountability of the states, and of course, even members of the uh, armed groups and in certain situations, uh, including uh, criminal gangs, that they are actually held accountable with regard to the perpe perpetration of actions that um, displaced people. And, in, and this can be done, of course, through a human rights perspective, using the guiding principles in terms of documentation, in terms of ensuring the correct perspective, in uh, trying to, to um, implement accountability, and last but not the least, of course, is really promoting advocacy for the rights of internally displaced persons. Civil society, without civil society, this will not be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, for that. And we know that even though you've completed your mandate as a special rapporteur, you will continue to be a champion on many of these issues. So we count on working closely with you uh, in the years to, to come. Uh, if I could turn now very quickly to Mr. Uh, Ahmed Al Zubaydi, uh, if you're with us, if you could join us on screen, I'd like to ask if you have one more message, uh, one message uh, regarding uh, ensuring the voices of displaced people included in policy decisions around the world. Uh, Ahmed, if you're with us, if I can ask you to share one more uh, comment uh, or message for the world. Uh, on this issue. Ahmed, are you with us? No, 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 I'm not. Hi, the Fadl, if I could ask you 
uh, one last message uh, to the world on including displaced people in policy discussions, what would that message be? الرسالة الأخيرة هي أن الأطفال والشباب هم عوامل التغيير ولذا يجب إعدادهم وتأهيلهم وضمان مشاركتهم الفعالة وقيادتهم إضافة إلى إتاحة المشاركة لهم في المؤتمرات والندوات المتعلقة بالنزوح كذلك تبني حوارات داخلية للنازحين لسماع أصواتهم وضرورة إشراكهم في صنع القرار نحن حاليا على أعتاب التجهيزات والتحضيرات للمنتدى العالمي للاجئين نطالب بأن يتم تمثيلهم التمثيل العادل وإعطاء النازحين فرصة للمشاركة في هذا الحدث العالمي لسماع أصواتهم وإدراجها في قرارات السياسة التي تؤثر عليهم الأمم المتحدة والوكالات التابعة لها في مقدمة المفوضية تقوم بجهود كبيرة لتخفيف المعاناة النازحين وتقدم الدعم ولكن هذا الدعم قد لا يصل إلى النازحين بالشكل المطلوب واكتشفنا ذلك من خلال ما قمنا به من ورشات عمل وحوارات مع النازحين فبعض الدعم قد لا يتوافق مع الاحتياجات الضرورية والطارئة للنازحين ولحل هذه المعضلة أو المشكلة نشجع على العمل مع المنظمات التي تعمل في مناطق النزوح ونبارك الجهود والخطوات التي قامت بها المفوضية السامية لشؤون اللاجئين من خلال تشكيل المجلس الاستشاري فالعمل مع المنظمات هذه يعطي الفرصة للاستماع لمقترحاتهم ويعمل على إدراج أصوات النازحين في قرارات السياسات التي تؤثر عليهم وذلك من خلال رفع البيانات والمشاكل والتحديات والمقترحات والحلول المطلوبة من قبل النازحين أنفسهم لحماية حقوقهم وتحسين أوضاعهم وضمان استمرار عملية التعليم خصوصا للأطفال والفتيات أحب أن ننوه وأشيد بالمقترح التي تم وضعه في هذا الاجتماع والمتعلق بتخصيص مكتب من قبل الأمم المتحدة يعنى بشؤون النازحين فأنا أعتقد أن أكثر من 59 مليون شخص على مستوى العالم جديرون ويستحقون أن يتم الاستماع إلى أصواتهم إضافة إلى أن بعض الدول مثل اليمن تعاني من النزوح بشكل كبير جدا فهناك أكثر من أربعة مليون نازح في البلد إضافة إلى تدفق الآلاف من المهاجرين من القرن الأفريقي إلى اليمن في ظل وجود الحرب والنزاعات والصراعات في هذا البلد نأمل أن يصل صوتنا إلى صناع القرار وشكرا على إتاحة هذه الفرصة وبالتوفيق للجميع شكرا لك سيد الزبيدي Thank you so much for those remarks um, Let us move now back to Honduras uh, for uh, to Madam Secretary uh, Natalia Rogue uh, If I could invite you also to give one final piece of advice, if we may say, a recommendation, your, your, your country's leading the way. Uh, if you have a recommendation uh, for others, uh, other countries around the world for, or for citizens around the world regarding uh, the importance and uh, of breaking through on laws and policies for internal displacement or on the guiding principles. Uh, Madam Secretary, over to you for any final messages or remarks you may have. Muchas gracias. Sí, muy brevemente señalar la importancia de la participación de las personas desplazadas en todos los procesos de construcción de política pública. Para nosotras, en la construcción de la ley ha sido fundamental la inclusión de las personas desplazadas internamente por violencia. Decir que en esta última etapa contamos directamente con la participación de 70 personas desplazadas en la construcción y en riesgo de desplazamiento en la construcción de la política pública, además de haber sido consultada con 27 instituciones del Estado, con organizaciones de sociedad civil y por supuesto que con los actores de la cooperación internacional 
eh, específicamente atendiendo temas humanitarios y especialmente en la oficina del alto comisionado, reconocer nuevamente su trabajo comprometido, decir que este es un logro que también es de la oficina de la, del alto comisionado, porque han sido quienes han acompañado directamente a las comunidades don, durante este largo proceso de construcción que culmina ahora con mucha voluntad política en la promulgación de la ley, pero que viene desde hace ocho años en un proceso de construcción desde las organizaciones que están en el territorio y con la inclusión de las personas desplazadas. Solamente muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for that. Voy a dar la palabra a la representación de la Secretaría de la Presidencia para hacer algún comentario. Muchas gracias por la palabra, ministra Roque. Juni Choi, asesora legal de Secretaría de la Presidencia. Uno de los aspectos muy relevantes de esta ley es la creación de un sistema de atención nacional de respuesta a desplazamiento forzado internamente. Este órgano, esta, o este sistema crea tres órganos. Eh, la Secretaría de Derechos Humanos tiene un rol muy fundamental en esta implementación de este sistema a través de la dirección para la protección de personas desplazadas internamente por violencia, el cual tiene un rol extremadamente fundamental en la respuesta y en la búsqueda de soluciones duraderas uh, ante este gran fenómeno social. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, our colleagues in Honduras, uh, the government there, uh, for all of your remarks. So just before we turn the floor, we do have one video recorded remark. It's from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grande, who was not able to be with us today. And he did want to share uh, a very brief message uh, during this intervention segment. I would like to thank the special rapporteur on the human rights of internally displaced people, my good friend Paula Gaviria, for convening us for this event. And I would like to thank all those taking part. I am very pleased to add my voice to commemorate the anniversary of the guiding principles on internal displacement. 25 years ago, I remember that very well, UNHCR strongly supported the establishment of the guiding principles and contributed to their drafting. Today, we continue to stand up for them promoting efforts for their incorporation into regional documents and legal instruments. For us, the guiding principles are beyond the compilation and restatement of legal rules. They have key strategic value, placing human rights and the protection of internally displaced people at the center and shaping our responsibilities in all the dimensions of protection. And as we intensify our actions to address the challenges of internal displacement, the guiding principles are as critical as ever, remaining the foundation of our efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the High Commissioner for Refugees. As you could see, uh, we echo his sentiments regarding the guiding principles being more than just a restatement of law, but in case indeed being uh, the foundation of our efforts uh, today. Uh, may, may I now turn the floor to the permanent representative of Austria to the, to the United Nations, Ambassador Desiree Schweitzer. Uh, over to you, Austria. Excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the floor. I'm speaking on behalf of Ambassador Desiree Schweitzer, who is uh, not, uh, could not be present here. Uh, I want to thank you for organizing this important event, marking the 25th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on the Internal Displacement. As we gather today, we are faced with an unprecedented movement of intertwined crisis from climate change to war and human rights violations. This has resulted in over 100 million people being forcibly displaced worldwide, with nearly 70 million of them being internally displaced. Just recently, the number of internally displaced persons in Turkey and Syria has skyrocketed as a result of the devastating earthquake. The guiding principles on internal displacement were developed in 1998 as a set of international standards that provide a framework for the protection of and assistance to IDPs. 
These principles are critical to ensuring that the human rights and fundamental freedoms of IDPs are respected and upheld during times of conflict, violence, and other forms of internal displacement. On the occasion of this anniversary, Austria reaffirms its strong commitment to respecting and protecting and fulfilling the rights and dignity of IDPs in accordance with these principles. As one of Austria's priorities at the Human Rights Council, our efforts aim to improve the legal, institutional and practical protection of internally displaced persons worldwide with the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs at the center of our efforts. Forced displacement is one of the most serious humanitarian problems of our times and current developments are not pointing to an improvement of the situation in the near future. Therefore, we urgently need to find sustainable solutions. The 25th anniversary of the guiding principles reminds us of the importance of upholding the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all people, regardless of their circumstances. We call on all states to uphold and properly implement the guiding principles on internal displacement in order to work towards a world where all people, including IDPs, can live in safety and dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And before we move to Ukraine, for the interests of trying to have as many interventions as possible, we do invite you, uh, if possible, to keep your interventions be between one and two minutes. Uh, the Ukraine, if I may. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists, colleagues. Uh, I thank the Special Rapporteur of Human Rights on IDP, UNHCR, IDP Protection Group, uh, group for, for, for convening us on this important uh, occasion. One can never emphasize enough the importance of guiding principles on the internal displacement, which have gained truly universal recognition. It is encouraging that an ever increasing number of displacement affected governments in every part of the world embrace the guiding principles by incorporating them in domestic laws and policies, with my country, Ukraine, being no exception. For instance, our law on IDP rights and freedoms of 2014 and subsequent strategic policy documents have been shaped around the guiding principles. <clears throat> they also inspired the preparation of a new comprehensive uh, Ukraine strategy for internal displacement until 2025, which is in the pipeline. Today's event could not be more timely. Russia's full-scale war of aggression against Ukraine caused one of the most horrific humanitarian crises on record, with staggering 19.5 million people affected by various forms of displacement. Not only does Russia's aggression hamper the end of displacement, but it also attempts to worsen it. Millions of Ukrainian IDPs remain trapped under Russia's continued attacks, being deprived of a near possibility to return and rebuild their lives. Today, we spoke a lot about state's responsibility. The internal displacement crisis we are witnessing in my country today is the result of the crime of aggression against Ukraine committed by the state, by Russia. We must address its root causes, not just the symptoms. It can only be done through ending the climate of impunity. Our message is clear on the 25th anniversary of the Guardian Principles, where violations of international law take place. National and international efforts to pursue accountability must be a priority. Accountability is a cornerstone of my president's uh, uh, peace formula aimed at bringing comprehensive, just and lasting peace to Ukraine and security to the whole world. Accountability has also been a key message of the numerous resolutions adopted by uh, the UN General Assembly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We urge UN member states to demonstrate their regional and political leadership by joining an international coalition for the establishment of a special tribunal for the crime of aggression uh, against Ukraine. Your support is essential to restore the sense of justice for victims of the war, including IDPs, to prevent displacement crisis from worsening, to guarantee safety and security for the entire world. I thank you. Thank you very much. We will move on. Uh, next to uh, the United States, and if I could call IDMC to follow the United States. Uh, but first with the United States, over to you. 
Thank you, Sam. Hello, my name is Ashley McLaughlin. I'm with the US Agency for International Development Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Thank you so much for this opportunity to hear from those who have been affected by the guiding principles and those who have played such an important role um, in shaping where our efforts are today. I'm very humbled by the progress that has been made and the long road ahead. As many have said, with forced displacement increasing year after year, we have to do more and think differently about our approach and how we can collectively better respond to the needs of IDPs while ensuring that the guiding principles remain the foundation of our response. Um, this is more important than ever. With this in mind, I just quickly wanted to call attention to two ongoing initiatives that the US government is supporting to accelerate these efforts. The first is um, an outcome of the Secretary General's action agenda, and this is the ongoing independent review of the collective response uh, to IDPs by the Interagency Standing Committee to look at how we can better um, respond to IDPs in the context of needs and rights-based uh, rights humanitarian assistance while paving the way for solutions. We are proudly supporting this review and look forward to its recommendations. We are also supporting the ongoing efforts of the UN Office of the Special Advisor on Solutions to Internal Displacement. Progress on solutions requires the commitment of national governments first and foremost, as well as response actors, civil society, and meaningful engagement of IDP communities. Mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Piper shortly on this important work. Finally, we call on all on this line to continue to support these efforts, keeping in mind their responsibilities outlined by the guiding principles and to support continued pro progress on supporting protection, including access to provide life-saving assistance to displaced populations and solutions for the millions of IDPs across the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much from the United States. And before I hand the floor to Alexandra Billock from IDMC, would like to flag that uh, colleagues from Niger and Venezuela who has requested to speak. If you're still online, please do raise your hand so that we can identify you uh, from the participants. Uh, and if not after that, we will go to UNDP after Niger and Venezuela. But before that, IDMC, Alexandra, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Sam, and thanks very much to our special rapporteur, Paula Gaviria, and to the GPC for organizing this event. I know I don't have much time left, but I just wanted to say it's a pleasure to, to be with all of you today on, on such an important date. And of course, an honor to see uh, Paula and her esteemed predecessors reunited here together to, to reaffirm the, ground na the groundbreaking nature and, of course, the continued relevance of the guiding principles. Um, this year, as you know, IDMC is also celebrating its own 25th anniversary, albeit, of course, on a much more modest scale. Um, IDMC was established to support with data and evidence the dissemination and the implementation of the guiding principles. And we're very grateful for the opportunity that this anniversary offers us to reflect on the global advances that we've made as an institution <clears throat> and on data specifically. Um, to look at the, how the knowledge that we've gathered, the lessons that we've learned, uh, have helped shape the narrative around internal displacement over the past quarter of a century. So we're very proud of these contributions, but also, and more importantly, of all the partnerships that have helped us achieve, uh, achieve this. And many of you are present here today, so, so thank you very much. Um, in a nutshell, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that we are now able to provide a, a global measure of the scale of internal displacement. And thanks to the data that is available now, we have shown that internal displacement is very much a global phenomenon, which has a global footprint. Uh, we're able to break down uh, our understanding of internal displacement according to different types of triggers, looking at different forms of conflict, different types of violence, but also uh, importantly now also understanding the impacts of sudden and slow onset disasters. We're also now able to better assess global disaster displacement risk uh, and, and look at, at hotspots and, and equip governments with the tools to prepare to respond to these hotspots. And more recently, we've done a lot of uh, methodological advancements when it comes to understanding the duration of internal displacement, its social and economic impacts, of course, the barriers and the enablers to solutions, uh, the differentiated impacts of displacement across different population groups, um, and the risk, the specific risk that, uh, that different countries face for the future. Um, we welcome the, the, reinfer, the uh, reaffirmed focus in this conversation that all the speakers today have placed on the principle of sovereignty as responsibility, a principle that has been reiterated 25 years on in the recommendations of the uh, high-level panel on internal displacement with its focus on the need to build and to support national ownership, including ownership of data and data systems. 
And with this, it's also been mentioned, we've also been encouraged by the multiplication of new spaces for dialogue, for political dialogue on this issue, which are being supported by a more systematic compilation and sharing of good practices, something that, that IDMC and many of our partners are, are prioritizing today. But importantly, and I'll just end on this, our advances in data and analysis have shaped, have helped us shape a new um, or several new narratives over the years. Uh, we're looking at it, as I said, as a global phenomenon. We know that not every country is affected in the same way. We know that climate change uh, is an accelerator of, of displacement, it's, but it's not the only factor. There are multiple factors involved, mostly socioeconomic. And today, internal displacement is as much a development challenge as it is a humanitarian one. And this year's global reports that we'll be publishing next month on food security is a good illustration of the need for continued multi-stakeholder, multi-mandated and integration uh, integrated approaches to this issue moving forward. And finally, it's really great to see such a close collaboration between the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs and uh, our Special Advisor on Solutions, two very critical and complementary roles and mandates that are so essential today for addressing the, the, this issue in all its multifaceted uh, nature. So IDMC stands ready to, to continue supporting both mandates to the best of our ability in the coming years. And again, thank you so much for inviting us for this very important event. It's, it's humbling to, to listen to everything that's been achieved over the last 25 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, and in the absence of Niger and Venezuela, in case you want to indicate yourselves in the chat, we will move now to UNDP, followed by GIPS, the Joint IDP Profiling Service. UNDP, over to you. UNDP, I see you online. Perhaps if you want to unmute yourself um, or if tech support colleagues could okay, uh, could uh, allow that or enable that. But in the meantime, let's go to GIPS, the Joint IDP Profiling Service. GIPS, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to also quick in and add. Um, really um, honored to address you today as the coordinator of GIPS. Um, and as we mark this milestone anniversary, it's really important to highlight that first and foremost, the guiding principles provide a comprehensive framework for upholding the human rights of IDPs as a fundamental aspect of achieving durable solutions. Without respecting human rights, no durable solutions can be found. And I think we heard today as well that it is a rights-based approach, which should be ensured through protection and empowerment strategies. And for that, we also heard very impactfully, also as described by the esteemed speaker from Yemen, that it is crucial to have a comprehensive and timely evidence, providing relevant data and analysis that acknowledges the complexities of durable solutions, the interests of various stakeholders and the unique characteristics of each context um, is still a significant obstacle to achieving this goal. However, I do want to highlight um, one of the achievement also of the last 25 years as key state forward uh, made uh, in that period um, after the development of the guiding principles and recognizing the agency and advocating for the human rights of IDPs has been the uh, operationalization of the ESC framework on durable solutions into the durable solutions indicator library. Through that uh, durable solutions analysis, we can of course explore to the extent the extent to which displaced populations face vulnerabilities caused by their displacement um, and identify specific interventions required to address these vulnerabilities. I'm also really pleased to see, of course, as highlighted not just by the special rapporteur herself, but also by Ambassador Deng and other speakers to ensure effective solutions analysis. It is crucial to consider the collaborative process involved and the resources required for collaboration. We know that it cannot be a single agency, a one-off assessment. We must consider that all components of this analysis come together and that this holistic approach engages IDPs from the moment data on their situation is being collected and analyzed, ensures that solutions are owned by them, by displacement affected communities reflecting their choices. So uh, keeping it brief, thank you so much for the opportunity to, um, to reflect. The work of DIPS remains, of course, grounded in the guiding principles as we promote the effectiveness of joint action to support the pursuit of solutions. And as we reflect on the 25th anniversary, we renew our commitment to the principles and to work together towards ensuring the rights and well-being of all those affected by internal displacement.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wilhelmina, for those remarks. Uh, and UNDP, we see uh, we've been, been able to unmute you. Uh, may I hand the floor to you for your remarks? Yes, thank you so much, Sam. Um, and, and really just to start with, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to reflect and to celebrate the guiding principles and their continued importance, given the growing internal displacement uh, crisis worldwide. As many other panelists, but also um, people from the floor have said, for us, we see the guiding principles as having a simple and enduring message that states are primarily responsible for the protection and assistance and in finding solutions for people that are displaced within their own borders. Seeing IDPs as citizens with rights rather than merely as people in need underpins the guiding and principles and now the high level panel report and the SG uh, action agenda. As UNDP in 2022, we released our own report called Turning the Tide on Internal Displacement and it echoes the guiding principles call for this renewed social contract between displaced citizen and state. But as others have said, we can't deny that more needs to be done and done differently. Efforts still too often come in the form of humanitarian interventions and stop short of addressing the root causes as well as providing sustainable solutions. But the Secretary General's action agenda is a, is a sign of new momentum on tackling displacement crisis and the desire to impact the guiding principles. When we speak to our UNDP colleagues in the field, what they tell us is that there is an urgent need for investment in people-centered approaches to basic services and pathways to integration. Resolving internal displacement means that IDPs must have the same opportunities and the choices of the rest of the population and human security is, is restored. Just to close, Sam, keeping to time limits, we at UNDP are stepping up our efforts and will continue to work with the Special Advisor on Solutions to Displacement, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, but most importantly with governments and local authorities to bring about this change. Internal displacement requires long-term integrated solutions that help countries break the cycle of fragility and get ahead of the crisis curve. And we at UNDP will be doing our part. Thanks, Sam, and thank you all colleagues. Thank you so much, Kate. Colleagues, I'm going to apologize. We are going to have to bring the interventions to a close here. Uh, we did get, I think, between 30 and 40 requests for uh, interventions uh, that we were so sadly not able to get to all of you. So Maria Halle, Emmanuel, Carlos, Mimi, and others, uh, we do appreciate your interest in speaking. Uh, also, we would like to flag, this is, once again, this is the beginning of, of a, a number of discussions around this uh, for the rest of the year. We will have cross-regional exchanges uh, that the IPEG and UNHCR will pick up the conversations on, uh, other opportunities. So we welcome you and also please feel free to continue to use the chat uh, for additional function, uh, for additional remarks. Uh, but to, for our closing remarks, I am pleased to introduce Mr. Robert Piper, if I can invite you to join us on screen here. Uh, the Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on Solutions to Internal Displacement. Mr. Piper brings to the position more than 30 years of experience in international development, humanitarian response and peace building at the UN. Before his appointment as special advisor, he was uh, head of the United Nations Development Corp Cooperation Office. Uh, thank you for joining us, Robert. Uh, if I could hand the floor to you for our closing remarks. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone. What an incredible privilege. I first to hear from some of the architects uh, who have really uh, uh, accompanied this process from the very beginning, from Francis, from Roberta, from Chaloka, from uh, uh, Cecilia, and most recently, of course, uh, uh, Paola Gaviria, who's taken on this mantle. We're missing Walter Kalin, and uh, we acknowledge his absence. But also to hear from some of the uh, more recent uh, stories that really emphasize how uh, um, the guiding principles are very much a live and real document. Uh, and we've heard uh, uh, from Honduras, from Natalia, from Ahmed in Yemen, and of course, um, uh, from Najima in South Sudan about the issues that are happening today uh, that really turn uh, the guiding principles into, into reality. As the youngest kid, maybe, uh, or the newest kid on the block, maybe not sadly the youngest, let me recognize the incredible painstaking work that has brought us to where we are today by so many people on this call. 
the guiding principles have really been the bedrock of all this work, emphasizing the responsibility of governments, the inalienable rights of IDPs with other citizens in their country, with the need to identify and recognize the specific vulnerabilities of people in displacement and the responsibility of all of us uh, to respond and to support. We've heard about how the architects approached this very delicate uh, process of finding a balance between uh, 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 this issue of, of, of using the framework to uh, establish the rules, if you will, of the game, the rights of IDPs, but also as a vehicle to engage governments fully uh, rather than uh, create some kind of uh, uh, counter reaction, if you will. We've heard about its journey into national legislation. Uh, uh, and into institutions, most recently in Honduras. We heard about its journey into regional uh, 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 vehicles and how uh, uh, the guiding principles were turned also to look at state responsibility rather than IDP rights, about the painstaking way in which a coalition of stakeholders was built around the process involving civil society, of course, but especially uh, IDPs, but also regional actors, about the importance of building institutions to actually roll out uh, these principles and to make sure that a civil society are some of those institutions locally, but also mayors and local government. Uh, and we heard about how uh, 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 the framework also included in many ways for the first time an emphasis on prevention uh, uh, and on solutions. Some really incredibly far thinking uh, 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 vision that went into designing uh, the, the guiding principles and their subsequent um, evolution. By carving out this space in our international jurisprudence for uh, IDPs, the architects and the member states who accompanied this process really uh, uh, helped consolidate a distinct identity uh, for this group of people who are unfortunately too easily lost uh, from sight. Without the guiding principles and the work that has followed, we really would be nowhere in terms of, uh, of, uh, of getting that visibility on this very difficult issue. But we still need to stay the course. 25 years on, let me mention three areas where we, we can see the challenges ahead. First, Let's be realistic. We have failed to get in front of the trend line. IDPs were 25 million people when the guiding principles were enacted in 1998. We are still waiting for the official numbers from Alexandra and her colleagues, but we know we're somewhere on the wrong side of 70 million people today, nearly three times as many as 25 years ago. We desperately need to get better on the prevention side. Second, we have somehow allowed displacement, protracted displacement for years and even decades to have somehow become normal, somehow acceptable. The guiding principles were not really conceived, I don't think, for a 20-year displacement scenario. They would have been outraged then if it was suggested as the sort of standard uh, kind of uh, scenario. And there should now be still outrage at the fact that this has become far, far too common. Of course, the principles still apply 20 years into a displacement, but there are a host of issues around, say, intergenerational questions, issues around very long delayed compensation, around identity that are in the principles already, but need some finessing, some new thinking, perhaps, in the context of very displa uh, uh, protracted displacement. And third, as a number of people has, have mentioned, climate change has really entered this picture in a big and very unwelcome way. The line between conflict and climate-induced displacement is harder to draw. The two plus million Somali IDPs who've moved to towns over recent years, it's been a process accelerated certainly by conflict, but the underlying driver is five years without rain, five years of successive droughts. Defining forced to flee or the coercive or un otherwise involuntary character of movement to quote, uh, uh, the principles has become more difficult 25 years on. This concerns the agency of the individuals concerned. It has some bearing also on governments that are affected by internal displacement and how fairly they look to other uh, governments to help them bear the cost uh, of finding solutions. Climate change, I suspect, is also going to make local integration an increasingly uh, uh, a popular option, if you will, for IDPs seeking solutions. 
So with the guiding principles as our North Star and with inspiration from the SG's high level panel on internal displacement, we're trying to move to the next chapter of our global IDP response. In this next chapter, we are advocating for greater recognition of the impact of climate change on displacement and getting governments and their partners to act proactively on climate induced mobility as a development challenge and to do so in such a way that allows these forces, these processes of change, these forces that are putting pressure on people to be managed as a development process and not allowed to become an internal displacement crisis. Second, we're working with humanitarian first responders to see how we might uh, design humanitarian responses to displacement in such a way that we reverse this increasing trend towards protracted displacement. Is there anything we can do early that might pay off in terms of making that transition out of displacement sooner or smoother? Greater investments in resilience, in livelihoods, building on national systems, ensuring that governments never lose sight of their responsibilities. Third, we're working with those governments themselves and their development partners to build a model for displacement solutions that is government led and development financed. If and when a government is committed to resolve their displacement issues in their country, respecting the guiding principles as the framework by which this needs to be done, how can we mobilize around this task? What kind of le political leadership is required from governments? How can the UN and its partners help? What might be the role of the IFIs or the climate financing uh, 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 instruments? What are the political and institutional obstacles that seem to prevent us from doing this, despite the clarity, if you will, of the vision? The Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement brings all of these ideas together around 32 commitments that have been made by the UN and 21 of our agencies. And it's a call to action by member states to make the necessary commitments on their side as well to turn these ideas into reality. My office will coordinate this work over the next two years and it will come to a close at a high level international event that is planned uh, around internal displacement in late 2024. So to finish this extraordinary discussion and to thank everyone for the wealth of uh, insight and experience, I want to acknowledge how extraordinary this, these guiding principles have been these past 25 years. As we look to the future, the contours of what needs to be done, of who needs to do it, and of how it needs to be done, the way that safeguards the rights of IDPs and fully restores their agency over their own lives, was spelled out for us in this path-finding path effort of the guiding principles. We really would be nowhere without them. So let me finish by taking this unique opportunity to recognize their architects that are around uh, 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 in our virtual space today to recognize the extraordinary work that they have launched uh, 25 years ago. And on behalf of the UN family to recommit us uh, uh, to turning these, uh, to respecting these guiding principles and to turning them into reality as we work with maybe 70 million or so IDPs around the globe today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you all for an extraordinary discussion. Back to you. Thank you so much, Robert, for that those closing remarks. And before we finally close, Paula, any last words as the convener of this important commemorative event today? Paula, over to you. Thank you so much to all of you for being here, to all of our amazing speakers and panelists for sharing the essential role of the guiding principles in the 25 years since we, they were drafted. I am so grateful to be part of this remarkable community. We have enormous challenges ahead, but I am so excited about what we can accomplish together in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much again. Back to you, Sam. Well, thank you. And so let's we will wrap up this. We are standing on the shoulders of so many who not only organized this event. I want to give a, a, a distinct thanks to the interpreters also for for their hard work throughout this event, but also all those who helped make this event a reality. As Robert, you said, and Paula, uh, you've confirmed, and all those who are with us, uh, we have the architects. We're standing on shoulders, but even today, we are all architects in this joint endeavor today. So I will close here and thank you for all those around the world that were able to join us. What a special moment.
Today, this commemora commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. We wish you all well. We thank you for participation, and we look forward to meeting again soon. Thank you so much.